budget 2018 is a good life, not a good life, says Irfan Ali. Government again promises to create employment for youths. More needs to be done to combat transnational crime, says Prime Minister Nagamutu. And Starbrook Square to be eliminated to guard against criminal activities. Those were the top headlines for the week ending December 8. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's weekend review, we tell you that on day one of the budget debate started in emphatic fashion by the first speaker here finale. The opposition member of parliament lashed out at the government dubbing the budget as a good lie instead of a good life. Here is more. The opposition party continues to make a mockery of the 2018 budget as they lay blame on the government for a tremendous decline in the production sector. Opposition Member of Parliament, Irfan Ali, who started off the debate, said the budget is devoid of any measure to research the economy. He said nothing has been provided for single parents, children and the private sector in the budget. Ali believes the suboptimal performance of the economy is not accidental, but one that attributes to poor policy decisions. If they are still satisfied that this government is performing, let them put a round of applause for Budget 2018. And you hear the silence? You hear the silence? Because they are satisfied with the proposition, Mr. Speaker. They are satisfied with the proposition now that they have been enlightened, that the government has underperformed, that the economy has underperformed, and the government has failed to deliver to the Guyanese people. Ali also lambasted the government for underperforming since the growth rate of the economy decreased significantly since 2015. He said the business community has become very toxic as there has been a major slide in the economy. This is the reality of this government. Decline in every aspect of economic life. Decline in every form of economic well-being. This is the reality that we are faced with. This is the good lie, Mr. Speaker. Ali claimed that Guyanese are still awaiting the good life. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. The Bishop's High teacher, who is accused of grooming young females, has been arrested and placed on bail. However, the man maintains his innocence. Nikhil Jondu with the details. Attorney Jerem Khan, who is representing the embattled teacher of Bishop's High, Cohen Jackson, confirmed that his client was arrested and placed on $100,000 bail. Khan, during an interview with News Update, stated that Jackson was invited to the Brigdam police station where he was arrested and placed on bail. Khan added that Jackson was instructed to return to the station on Monday morning. Uh, interviewed him, arrested him, interviewed him. They invited him to Brigdam where to place him under arrest. He gave them a statement. He denied the allegation and um, he's cooperated with the police and he's been placed on um, $100,000 bail. Attorney Khan noted that the individual who made the accusations is now hiding. This accusation was being pushed by Mr. Roald John. And uh, we claim there are hundreds of people who are victims. And we, 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 we find it very amusing that he talks about hundreds of, vi of, of victims, only one person comes, comes forward. Jackson is accused of grooming his female students for future relationships. Jackson was relieved of his teaching duties following the accusations leveled against him. Since the allegations were highlighted, several persons picketed Bishop's High for the removal of the head teacher. According to the statement from the Education Ministry, a committee comprising of the Chief Education Officer Marcel Hudson, the Ministry's legal advisor, among other committee members, met with Minister Nicolette Henry with their findings along with recommendations. That committee recommended that the head teacher apologizes to the students and teachers. The ministry also pledged to provide training and support to teachers on how to deal with children on sexual issues. In addition, counseling support which was requested by the students would be provided. Nikhil Jondu reporting for MTV News Update. The government has once again promised to create jobs. This time, the rhetoric was dispelled by Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin, who was at the time leading the government's charge in the 2018 budget debate in the National Assembly. This is despite the president himself that claimed that it is not the job of the government to create employment, rather the task should be for the private sector. 
Leading the debate on the government side, Minister of Business Dominic Gaskin stood firm with his colleagues as he pointed out to the opposition that the budget caters for the man in the street. Gaskin, who admitted that the government needs to do more, promised that more will be done. He said jobs will be created with the $218 million subsidy allocated for GoInvest. The agency projects to facilitate investments of $154 billion for the creation of approximately 5,725 jobs. Another job created method is a $148 million for entrepreneurs at the Small Business Bureau. In addition to this, he said an increased grant will be distributed to business students to cover their school-based assessment. The coalition party in the lead up to the 2015 general and regional elections promised to create jobs. However, after assuming office, President David Granger stated that it is not the job of the government to create jobs, rather the private sector has to do so. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Another murder suicide has rocked the country of Berbis and similar to past crimes. The suspect unleashed a scratching attack after he suspected his spouse was cheating on him. The man then allegedly committed suicide by hanging himself after stabbing his reputed wife to death. Find out more from Nikhil Jondu. The police are investigating an alleged murder suicide which occurred on Sunday. According to the police public relations officer Jairam Ramlakan, the incident may have taken place sometime between 9 hours and 18 hours 30 at Lot 26 Williamsburg, Quarantine Barbies. Dead are 40-year-old Indrawati Totaram and 36-year-old Krishna Lachman, who was a cane harvester. The couple was living in a small flat wooden house and shared a relationship for approximately 10 years. The police noted that Latchman accused his mate of having an extramarital affair. Normally, then two does fight, yes. Ah, uh, you should just go away. He do, and then he's not a bad oh person, too. He don't want person like that, like a murder man or a fight man. Or what. Normally, we just take a drink, he just sit down by he alone, sing by himself, and drink. But me never know if he ever tell she that, said that she even murder she and kill himself. Last Monday, the woman left the home but subsequently returned on Friday. The police added that on Sunday afternoon, a carpenter was passing the house when he observed the man hanging from the ceiling. The man immediately informed ranks at Rose Hall Police Outpost and they were summoned to the crime scene. The ranks observed that the door to the eastern side was open and upon investigating, discovered the man hanging from a rope. It was also observed that a cooking gas bottle was seen next to him, which he may have used to climb to tie the rope on the rafter. The police also discovered the woman naked in a pool of blood with two stab wounds to her right breast, two stab wounds to her right side abdomen, and one stab wound to her right arm. An electrical wire was also tied around her neck. The suspected murder weapon, a knife, with what appeared to be blood stains, was seen on the fridge. Both bodies were taken to the Port Barrand Hospital, where they were pronounced dead. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The opposition party scolds the government for their failure to relieve farmers of the tax burdens. The opposition is also peeved that the government has not dropped the increased fee for drainage and irrigation and land rental charges. Here's more. Opposition Member of Parliament Dharm Kumar Siraj said the sector continues to be marginalized. Siraj said this is due to the lack of budgetary measures and incentive from the government. He pointed out the plight farmers face as they are forced to pay an increased fee for drainage and irrigation and land rental charges. This punitive measure was placed in Budget 2017 and it remains untouched. The MME Authority continues to lament being unable to collect on the old rate of $3,500. What will happen now with the imposition of the 15,000? The GRDB, sir, is also now complaining about being unable to collect on credit given out in fertilizer. And some of the reasons being cited, of course, sir, are effects of flooded, reduced productivity, reduced prices, delayed payments, and even them, those, even the GRDB, sir, is unable to collect on a timely basis from this sector. But where are the measures to address the real plight? 
Sirad said the farmers' frustration has been demonstrated through industrial actions, but it brought no change. On the other hand, Opposition Member of Parliament Komal Chan said the budget is replete with many anti-people policies. He stated that the government has nothing new to offer and is only recycling projects from the previous administration. Chan said sugar workers continue to be at a loss as the security of their jobs and benefits are uncertain. He also took the time to reiterate the call for the government to retake the decision of closing three more of the six existing sugar estates. This for us of the PPC is deeply disturbing, especially given that thousands stand to be affected by the decision laid out in the paper. You see that the government is unsure that it can defend convincingly the wrong decision that they are taking. It appears so, given that those inefficient, inefficient estates are attracting, attracting several interests, which should tell us, Mr. Speaker, that the government decision require a second unbiased look. The agriculture sector has received $19.4 billion in the 2018 national budget. Defending the massive $267.1 million budget was the minister within the Ministry of Communities, Valerie Patterson Yearwood, who announced that the budget focuses on developing Guyana. She claims it is reflective on the $6 billion of the budget allocated to the housing sector. Yanis Abrams filed this report. We started this journey and we will continue this journey until the good life is de delivered to every Guyanese. Then we will start a new journey to the better life. So it means that we are in there for a long time. And then when we finish the better life, we'll have the best life. Yes. Mr. Speaker, to borrow a few statements, I can boldly declare, we are not where we want to be, but we are surely, we surely are not where we used to be. The journey must continue. That was the Junior Minister of Communities, Valerie Patterson Yearwood, defending the 2018 national budget. The minister also laid out several projects that are being spearheaded by her ministry. At Perseverance, we are currently constructing 18 bungalow two-bedroom units, 40 flat concrete duplexes. As I speak, you can go on the ground and see them. 50 elevated concrete two-bedroom units, 15 flat two-bedroom units, and 15 flat three-bedroom units. If you know maths, you can count them. For the Mr. Speaker, we also have in progress construction of 10 elevated concrete two-bedroom units at Andalim in Esequibo. 10 elevated concrete two-bedroom units at Andalim in West Bank. 10 elevated and five flat concrete two-bedroom units and five flat three-bedroom units at Hope Experiment, West Coast Babies. During the minister's address to the speaker, she announced that, due to the plea of National Commission on Disability, the CHNPA will be building homes that are disability friendly. Minister Yearwood reiterated the squatting situation that has been occurring in Guyana since 1992. Mr. Speaker, discussions are ongoing regarding the development of approximately 1,148 lots at Plantation Commons Lodge and Industry for the possible relocation of squatters from constituencies five and six reserves, as well as from other zero tolerance areas in Georgetown and in St. Byron's. This intervention requires an estimated investment of approximately $2.65 million for infrastructure alone. In the 2018 national budget, the Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan, allocated $6 billion to the housing sector. This came from the budget of $267.1 billion. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. 
Regardless of the fact that three sugar estates are on the chopping block next year, the Minister of Agriculture, Noel Horta, announces that all other subsectors will expand, which means that the agriculture sector will grow. Minister of Agriculture Noel Holder says the agricultural sector is expected to contribute 14% to the economy in 2018. Sugar production is expected to increase by 41% with the remaining three estates in 2018. Holder said production will increase from a mere 55 tons to 78.3 metric tons. However, capital investment of 12 billion will be required over the next three years to ensure that the sugar production targets are met. Mr. Speaker, despite the magnitude of subsidies, there will be no positive impact on the financial state of Gaisuko. The economy simply cannot afford it. Rice production is also expected to increase with access to new markets and new yields. With access to five new markets, rice will see a 12% increase for the new year. The Borough Rice Association has 60 acres under cultivation of a new high-yielding variety that is expected to be released to farmers by April 2018. The industry will be producing high-quality seed of internationally acceptable quality, establish a national seed certification program, and produce three new varieties, one aromatic and two hybrids, by 2019, via the Malaysia Rice Production Reverse Linkage Project. For the five acres of land will be provided over the next three years for coconut production. This will see the planting of 100,000 seedlings annually by the Hope Coconut Factory in Nari. With the expansion of the livestock industry, the sector is expected to grow by 2%. Still on the budget, opposition parliamentarian Dr. Frank Anthony states that allocation into the agriculture sector has dropped significantly since the government has taken power in 2015. Dr. Anthony, during his parliamentary speech, went on to say that the government does not care for the people of the nation. Yanis Abrams filed this report. In 2017, this year at West Demerara Hospital, X-ray is not working after 9 p.m., but the government don't care. The anesthetic machine at West Demerara Hospital not working, but the government don't care. Leaking roofs in the bond at West Demerara has caused the drug bond to be in disarray, but the government don't care. That was Opposition Member of Parliament Dr. Frank Anthony opening the second day of the debate on National Budget 2018. The parliamentarian during his address to the Speaker spoke about the failing agriculture sector. Dr. Anthony stated that there is a $2.3 billion reduction in the budget for the agri-sector when compared to the sum given last year. Agriculture has the distinction of being the only sector that has consistently received a cut in budget allocation since APNU AFC took office. This clearly shows the government's intention of downsizing, de-emphasizing, and perhaps downgrading agriculture. As time draws nearer to the closing date of the sugar estates, according to the former minister, the government is continuing what he coined as quote-unquote the backstabbing drama. The Member of Parliament questioned the welfare of the workers after the closure of the three sugar states. Where are the plans for the sugar industry? Is there a plan to retrain the sugar workers? Is there a plan to help the sugar workers find new jobs? Is there a plan to give the sugar workers soft loans so that they can start a business? Is there a plan to give the sugar workers land on these estates? Where are these plans? Dr. Anthony further went on to chastise the government about the management of the Public Health Ministry. In response to the statement of the Junior Minister of Public Health, Dr. Karen comments about the implementation of drug procurement procedures, the opposition parliamentarian stated that it has not fixed the procurement crisis in the ministry. Let us look at the Auditor General report for 2017, paragraph 447, and it pointed out that the minutes of the ministerial tender board, the minutes are not kept. Yet, the ministry has awarded 
contracts worth millions of dollars without any evidence whether it was awarded to the lowest or the highest bidder, whether the contracts were split, whether these contracts were advertised, and when it was done, and who got these contracts, or whether it was sole sourced, or whether these companies were compliant. None of this information is available because the ministry did not keep any minutes. In the 2018 national budget, $33.3 billion was allocated to the public health sector. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Despite calls from the opposition to address drug shortage, the health minister failed to bring the issue to the forefront as the budget debate continues on day three. Here's more. Despite challenges, Minister of Public Health, Vola Lawrence, says her ministry will keep the momentum in par with the health and well-being of the people. Clothing, the minister noted that a strategic step was taken by the ministry to implement a human resource department. She said the department will identify the gap of key positions lacking all departments. However, Lawrence did not address the overtime shortage of drugs, which has been publicly admitted by the minister. The Ministry of Public Health would like to thank the Minister of Finance, Honorable Winston Jordan, for the confidence he has placed in the health sector by injecting $33.3 billion, which represents an increase of 7% over the 2017 budget, thereby providing the Ministry with the financial resources resources so that our nation can continue to enjoy the journey to the good life. Starting on a good note, Lawrence reported that there was a reduction of tuberculosis cases since 2015. While 510 cases were recorded in that year, that figure has been reduced to 340. Further, the medicine policy and emergency drugs were reviewed by the Ministry in 2018. On the other hand, Opposition Member of Parliament Barry Ramsaran accused the government of spending on projects that are not priority for health. Ramsaran advised that teams should be trained instead of non-specialist personnel to deal with mental health patients. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. It is time for a change in both the leadership of City Hall and Central Government to form his former president, Don Ramutar. He says Guyana needs new visionaries, a quality that is lacking from both offices. Godfrey Brooms filed this report. There are a lot of persons that are peeved with City Hall, especially since the administration continue to cry for finances. One of those persons is a former president, Donald Ramotar. He claims that there is a need for a change in the administration of City Hall, since they have time and again proven that they cannot effectuate the task. However, he did not stop there. He also claims that it is time for the country to see new leadership. Speaking exclusively with News Update, former President Donald Ramatar said the administrative body at City Hall does not have the capacity to maintain Georgetown. This he attributed to the condition of the city, City Hall's a perpetual cry for money and the internal feud. He claims it is time for Georgetown to be graced with new leaders who are visionaries. However, he believes not only the council should be cleansed of the top brass, but also central government. There's new leadership, they need for new leadership in the whole country, not only City Hall, I would say. Uh, they, these people are failing this country miserably. And they, the economy has slowed almost to a halt. Look, this is almost Christmas and look at the place. You know, it looked like a Sunday, um, a Friday afternoon, it's Friday, which will be a very busy day. Looks like a Sunday still. So, I will, City Hall is only a microcosm of what is happening with the government. It is not the first time calls have emanated for the top brass of City Hall to be thrown out of office through numerous protests by the Guyana Market Vendors Union and civil society. Calls have surfaced to have the town clerk Royston King, Mayor Patricia Chase Green, and the Chief Constable Andrew Fu removed. City Hall has been again granted money by central government this time to the tune of $200 million. Prior to this, the government had to rescue the council 
by paying over $300 million to Sivon's Waste Management and the Poran Brothers Incorporated, debts the council had accumulated since 2015. Additionally, in 2015, City Hall was granted $300 million by the coalition government to beautify Georgetown. After that money depleted, City Hall had no plan to maintain the aesthetics of the city. Meanwhile, despite former President Donald Ramatar is calling for the government to be replaced, it is the same coalition party he lost to when he was pressured to call snap elections in 2015. Ramatar's term in office started in 2011 and was short-lived after it ended in 2015. He called for snap elections after proroguing parliament. Reporting for MTV News Update, I am Godfrey Brooms. Prime Minister Moses Nangamutu says there is need for closer collaboration and sharing of intelligence among countries to combat transnational crimes. The Prime Minister was at the time speaking at the annual Caribbean Nations Security Conference, which is being held in Guyana for the fourth time. Nikhil Jondu filed this report. Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu, in addressing the security personnel and delegates of the various countries, emphasized the need for closer collaboration and sharing of intelligence. He noted that since the coalition government came into office in 2015, the administration has been relentlessly cracking down on drugs and arms traffickers. The Prime Minister declared that Guyana and the remainder of the Caribbean have to be aware of the real threats posed by terrorists and terrorist activities. If we had not been victim of major terrorist episodes as yet, it gives us time so that we can anticipate and we can precipitate so that at some time or the other, with this scorch this blemish, this danger to humanity will descend in our peaceful region. The Prime Minister also told the Army and Navy personnel that information sharing has become more readily available between Ghana and its partner, the United States of America. Nagamoto noted that in recent months, through information sharing, piracy on the high seas have decreased drastically. Our fishermen have been at the mercy of pirates for many years. Today we have reduced incidents of piracy to one or two single digit numbers, as low as one and two per year. Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defense Force, Brigadier Patrick West, welcomed the delegates to the land of many waters. The Chief of Staff noted that this conference comes at a time when Caribbean states are faced with numerous challenges, ranging from climate change to security. The region has experienced and continues to be challenged by the increasing threats of cybercrime. The security forces are in many instances way behind the perpetrators of these crimes. And we need now more than ever to be able to be in step with or ahead of this new level of technological challenge within the region. Commander of the U.S. Southern Command, Admiral Kurt Tidd, told the gathering that networking with partners in this hemisphere is key to intelligence gathering to contain criminal activities. The collective investments we have made are not just investments in our shared security and prosperity. They are investments in one another. They are investments in the capacities of our civilian military and our interagency institutions. Investments in our interoperability in areas like disaster response and countering threat networks. And investments in improved cooperation and coordination at the strategic, operational and tactical levels. The conference will bring together more than 50 key U.S. and Caribbean senior defense and law enforcement representatives. Its aim is to unify regional to counter transnational and transregional threat networks. The conference will also develop mechanisms for greater security coordination, improve information sharing, and support mutual security goals, as underscored in the Caribbean 2020 strategy. 
Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Now on the police's blotter. Former Crime Chief Gwendal Blanham is now second in command of a division. Blanham's posting to that division has come in for criticism, given that he had opened and solved a number of high-profile cases. Find out more in this report. Minister of Public Security Kamraj Ramtitan has broken his silence following the reshuffling of several senior ranks within the Ghana Police Force. One senior rank, former Crime Chief Wendell Blanham, has been reassigned to the 8th Division and would be second in command. Blanham served as Crime Chief from May 2015 until he was sent on annual leave and then reshuffled when he returned on the job a few days ago. Minister Ramjitan made it clear that those decisions are directly made by the Commissioner of Police. I have asked that that be directed to the Commissioner, operational matters as to where uh, assistant commissioners and senior superintendents are placed is in the hands of the person performing the functions of the commissioner. And I think he has answered that to the extent of saying that he would like to see him at this stage as deputy in um, uh, region, D D D Division A. And he has since gone there. I understand that's the position of the leadership of the force as presently is. And he has been asked to go there and he has gone there. Acting Commissioner of Police David Ramnarine also stated that the decision to remove Blanham was a policy of the leadership of the force. Ramnarine explained that there are a number of initiatives for the end of the year. But may I add as part of an explanation that Senior Superintendent Calvin Brutus was the commander of C Division and was on leave and resumed and is right now holding at uh, second in command of operations because senior superintendent Mansell who held for him while he was on leave i've asked Mansell similarly to continue as um, the commander of c division um, until sometime during the, the greater part of the christmas season being over so it's not like unusual mr blanham's um, reposting is also not without precedent that i've said before you had an, an assistant commissioner who was crime chief who was reposted and, and so on so it's not like unusual Ramnarine also stated that Blanham is out of the Criminal Investigations Department. At this point in time, yes, it would appear so. That he is indeed out of the Criminal Investigations Department at this point in time. One can never say definitively, come next year, what are some of the changes that are going to happen, but one must brace themselves for that. So at this point in time, that's it. Blanham's successor is Assistant Commissioner of Police Paul Williams, who will continue to act in that capacity as Crime Chief. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. On a brighter note, Foreign Affairs Minister Carl Greenwich assures Guyanese that the country's territorial integrity remains intact. Additionally, the minister informs that Guyana needs to position itself on the international map. Here's more. Minister of Foreign Affairs Carl Greenwich said the branding of Guyana is paramount. As such, the country would have to generate a brand in relation to the countries it works close with. Greenwich related that this is to ensure that Guyana is kept on the forefront of the international agenda. I'm speaking of it in the broadest sense, and that sense means that, for example, you can't turn up to a meeting in uh, Azerbaijan or in Washington uh, out of... Uh, out of the blue and simply explain to the international community that you would like support in A or B, you have to establish um, in their minds, in the, in the minds of our, our bilateral and international partners, an image of a country that, for example, stands for something. On the Venezuela border controversy, teams have been created by both countries to continue negotiation. The Guyana team included representatives from civil society, opposition and the government. The team comprises of professionals with a legal background on territorial claims, according to the minister. Additionally, a process is also being looked at to resolve the question of the arbitral award at the soonest. The arbitral award is ultimately about those borders, but it is really a decision on whether the court uh, somehow in making this decision had acted improperly or uh, in a manner that was uh, um, not in keeping with the law. So that uh, process, Mr. Chairman, 
we will finish soon. When it said working with countries with similar problems will aid in lending support to territorial challenges. He also believes that an active involvement in the international arena will aid in evolving Guyana. The opposition has written to the finance minister objecting to the reformulation of the loan contract on road network upgrade and expansion program. It is believed that the government diverted the funds for the Sheriff Street and Mandela Avenue upgrade to facilitate the Safari Road Network renovation. More in this report. Opposition Member of Parliament Juan Edgel said a letter was sent to the finance minister seeking clarification on the matter. Edgel said the loan was intended to facilitate the upgrade of Sheriff Mandela and Timiri Diamond Highways. The road networks in Canal No. 1 and 2 and the East Bank Barbies Highway were also in its original design. The letter was sent due to speculations that the US$30 million United States dollars loan from the Inter-American Development Bank for the aforementioned road upgrades was diverted. The initial loan of US$66 million United States dollars was said to be diverted to facilitate the Safari Road Network upgrade. We have since learned that that loan has been reformulated and US$30 million out of that 66 million is being allocated to Sophia for roads and as we understand it they'll be building homes and giving subsidies for the improvement of homes. If this is the case, the opposition will also like to know what measures will be put in place to service the communities targeted under the original design. Agile said they will remain opposed to the reformation until they are sure that the IDB funds will not be used for political purposes. We have basically said to Minister Jordan, the President of the IDB, the Executive Director of the Caribbean's IDB and the Country Representative of the IDB, we are opposed to that reformulation until we are satisfied as it relates to the justification. Because since we have seen the pattern of the coalition government acting in partisan manner, we are concerned that that money will be used to fund homes of party activists and their families and will be used as a slot fund for political purposes. Amid the frequency of criminal activities around Stabrook Square, the Ministry of Public Infrastructure is in the process of installing a lighting system around the area. This, coupled with the frequent patrol around the market, is expected to decrease the criminal activities. Yanis Abrams tells us more. The Ministry of Public Infrastructure has already planted a few poles in front of Stabrook Square. The poles will soon be equipped with lights to illuminate the area. We want to have the area um, well illuminated for the festive season, so that's the reason why you're, you have seen the poles being erected there. Minister Ferguson wasn't able to provide the cost for the new initiative. The minister also hopes for the project to be completed for Christmas season. Well, we hope to have it completed just before um, you know, the festive season, even though we are in the festive season, but we want to have that area completed um, just before the 25th of December. In the 2018 national budget, the Public Infrastructure Ministry was allocated $35 billion from the $267.1 billion budget. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Aramps. That's a wrap for MTV News Updates We Can Review. The newscast can be viewed online on our MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, December 11 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Sandy Ramutar, thanking you for watching.